Returning from our journeys to the deep 90s, back to the future in 2015, we join Alan Lundell and his mythic friend Peter Fay for an epic hot tub confab high on the mountaintop of Future Peak here in the Santa Cruz Mountains. I have known Al and his partner's son since moving to this magical misty shire back in 1994. Not only is Al a true bonhomme, but he is also a keen observer of the cyber culture and developing trends in tech and the social landscape. He chronicles all this in his KSCO Santa Cruz radio show, Dr. Future. Twenty years back, Al and I had the vision of some kind of ethernet to share conversations between populated hot tubs. Finally, we have realized this dream in this first ever Tubcast for you here in the Levity Zone. So dip in with us now as Al, Peter, and I ply the waters of topics as diverse as the veracity of spiritual teachers to the interplay between science and Gaia, to my upcoming schmooze cruise with the billionaire set, some recent insights on a new theory of the origin of life, and living within the avatars of our mythic selves. We emerged from our soak to watch Al pilot his brand new high-tech, high-def drone on its maiden voyage high off future peak to its fate uncertain. It's conversations on the edge, but it's the edge of the hot tub. Right, exactly. exactly. We ought to record a Levity Zone podcast right here, exactly. right now, in this hot tub. Okay. All okay. right. So, uh, this is Alan Lundell of Dr. Future fame, and I've known him 25 years. And, and Bruce almost. is up here at Future Peak, in the hot tub. A, a very fun place to be, at the top of the world here, to think about reality and stuff reality and stuff and i just got through reading this long email diatribe where deepak chopra declared that all atoms have consciousness and we heard about richard dawkins taking him apart about that but he's still obviously going on about it so why why do these spiritual teachers feel they have to become experts in science and embarrass themselves and everybody else well bruce i think it's related to the idea that uh, you know once you get some amount of fame you can apply it to other fields it's it's kind of like if you know if you made a millions of dollars in designing a paperclip, <laughs> then uh, people will ask you the other philosophy of life on just about everything imaginable, <laughs> right? right? right. <laughs> so that's my theory. So, uh, Dr. Future uh, thinks that it's, you know, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. But then they embarrass themselves so much. I mean, they, well, they, they embarrass step them, out of their yeah. fields and they, yeah. and they, they create mass confusion and mythology and and yet people listen to them and why you might ask why do they listen to them because hmm. it corn it kind of makes sense if you're not a scientist i think if it it's appeals feel, to certain feelings it's maybe? a feel-good thing yeah in communism in the soviet union when communism ended people were in a panic because there wasn't somebody around them to tell them what to do and what to think yeah and so in the West, with such a, uh, a mushy education system and really poor parenting for the last 40 years or so, you get people who really want others to tell them what to think and how to feel about the human future and themselves. Yeah. And so it's cheap and easy. It's packaged spirituality. I Ready guess. to go. Ready to go, yeah. Put it in the microwave and well, I used typing to, hot. Well, they used to call it, when you come to California, uh, roll your own religion. Roll think, your own religion. In the sixties, I think that was that was the popular thing. But of course, then yeah. then we, we we switch into our magic mode and we all get into it. So where it's real, right? And that's what um, our <laughs> our current artist in resonance is all about with uh, being into the mythica because right. then it's about you being a mythic character in some co uh, comic book of your own design. Right, but isn't that yeah. just self delusion? Is well, when you, when you, when that's you, part of being a hero. <laughs> I guess yes. desolation can be fun for a while. Right, right. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> but then you then you get back on the freeway and you can't be in that mythic character anymore. Oh. You know, it's, it's it's a sort of protected element. Well, unless life. unless we change society where like something major shifted, like where the authorities were trained to see us all as God. 
Mm. You know, that would do mm -hmm. it, I think. That would do that, it. Unlikely to happen in the near future, unless you figure out a way of reversing the field of the, the immune system, the constabulatory uh, thinking process, and how them seeing all of us as God as a way of controlling oh, the bad guys. You know, if you can figure all that out, then, you know, maybe. Like uh, Krishnamurti or the Buddha would have said, you're God, you just, you just deny it. Exactly. Is that the illusion is that you're not. Well, how are you separated from the creative process of the universe? I mean, how exactly right. are you separated from it? But then if, if you, it doesn't it play into the ego and the sort of juvenility of our society that you tell people they're God and they're just going to become petulant and grasping and, and me, me, me and wanting attention. Is that the ultimate godhead, in your opinion? Well, for them, it's they're going to take it that way. Yeah, well, until, they get the, every until they learn the lessons from that, right? I mean, they'll do mm -hmm. that. If they think that's God, and they end up giving a super big ego, what are the lessons of uh, spiritual ego? Uh, that um, you would get, you from get the a universe? lot of rewards. From okay, so is there any downside to high spiritual ego? Um, any? Can't think of it at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> that's a problem, right? You know that you transcended duality. <laughs> yeah, I think... Uh, yeah, uh, you can have as many offspring as you want, as many houses as you want. Yeah. Um, so you can have anything you want uh, in terms of uh, any of the basic necessities of life. The, the uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs Maslow's would be fulfilled. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, the, all the chakras would be working. All the chakras would be working. It's when you fail to pay your taxes, then it becomes a... Uh, so you have plenty of money then. You'd, as a I god, know. you would always have abundance, right? That would or as a, even a pseudo-god, you'd have abundance. Yeah, not even an issue. Not an issue. Yeah. No, no. So pseudo gods are right up there with gods. Right? <laughs> gods are on a sparing diet. Gods are on uh, austerity programs, and the pseudo gods will just zoom past them, like <laughs> drag racers on the spiritual drag strip. <laughs> Until they run into some kind of obstacle. Yeah, because the <laughs> yeah because the pseudo gods got them surrounded. There's so mm. many. Mm. Yeah. Now, do the pseudo gods listen to the real gods? Hmm. I think they, they carry their pictures around in their wallets <laughs> with their stuff with their banknotes. To remind them of the real thing. You know. yeah, and they show the real gods portraits in their ashrams so that they get some credibility. Mm -hmm. so, well, well, okay, yeah, I can see that. But what about also that if you see the, the one that you uh, thought was enlightened or you think is enlightened, see actually into their, their eyes that they're actually is some kind of um, psychic resonance that you set up with that field of that being in some way that uh, you become part you, of. You know what I found out when the ashrams in India when somebody actually gets a full channel of the energy yeah. whatever the energy means yeah they make them sweep the ashram for a year to keep <laughs> it from attaching to ego and for them going off right <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 so the, the, the enlightened Seriously. ones, yeah, they're, the enlightened ones mm. are saying, okay, now you sweep and clean the toilets for a year because they want to prevent yeah. the transference of the energy into that. Yeah, that's interesting. I, last time I heard about that was like John Vaughn talking about how if you wanted to show your uh, mastery, you had, you'd be willing to uh, clean the front steps of the temple with a toothbrush for a year. With a toothbrush for yeah, a year. Like yeah. It could take a week just to do it once. Yep, yep. So like our friend of ours who followed a guru to an ashram in mm. India, mm. and then he declared that he was going to leave this life to commit samadhi. But it turns out this guy was a major boozer. And this guy drank himself to death <laughs> because the, the autopsies in the local Indian, hmm. you know, coroners show that this guy had drunk himself to death. So in that way, Terence McKenna is right, or Kaushik is right. Kaushik, you know, the doctor that I put on the levity zone, mm -hmm. he said in his Indian dialect, if the guru dies and you find the followers in the court fighting over the papers of succession, then neither the guru nor the initiates had ever any contact with the logos. <laughs> so it's like, you know, if that's what you leave behind, you leave behind people fighting over money and power and... All the things that the guru supposedly transcended. Right. Then, yeah. then it's all been for naught. Yeah, because no one really. learned their lesson. And the guru was not able to pass it on, so he might as well not have even... He didn't have it, it in the right? first place, yeah. He just thought he did. Yeah, well, it turned into a business. Yeah. It turned into a business. Yeah. Yeah, the business. So that ends up corrupting the, uh, the higher consciousness. It's a great photo with the, with the thing coming on, with the smoke. You guys want a shot of this? Sure, sure. Yeah.
Well, we're going to be shot, so this will be part of our tub cast. Yeah, we can put it on. We'll with, have with the, this is still with the with the podcast. Yeah, thanks to Peter, we'll get a still for this very podcast, which will go out as the next podcast. Oh, really? Yeah. And by the way, Levity Lo Zone, Le Levity Lone, Levity Zone listeners, I'm getting aboard a cruise ship in Miami a week from tomorrow, so November 12th of 2015. It's a Summit at Sea schmooze cruise with 5,000 yeah. people. And they have me doing an evening performance talk called Fire in the Sky with Android Jones, projecting the art. Oh, really? Wow. And or it's an experiment. Yeah. And then uh, that's on Friday evening. And then on Saturday, I'm talking a science talk about origins and future of life. Out on, in, on the under the stars and the that'll be in an, in a in state the, room or conference room in the ship with a with a PowerPoint PowerPoints and movies and the yeah. whole thing. And the attendees mm -hmm. include Eric Schmidt, the mm -hmm. adult at Google, and the founder of Uber, and Martha Stewart, and Harry Belafonte, and 300 other eminence greases and emissaries. And well, a good PR person would tell you to contact their contact people and let them know about your event. Ah, yeah. okay. They would say that. And um, a good schmoozer would create some buzz about your event <laughs> so that they hear about it and, and it becomes the cool underground event on the, on the ship to ah. attend at that time. Ooh, how, how could we find such a schmoozer uh, in a week and get them planted and... Uh, I don't know, but I'm just, you know, from a storytelling point of view, that would be... That would be the... Way to do it. Wow, Al is the pro here. <laughs> future future listeners... If I, had a, if I had a global network, I would activate... I, you know, there's probably some social networks there that interact with our social networks. And if yeah. we go through the social networks, the actual people that know people... Right. Rather Maybe I should the, just post this all on my social network. There's several people I know who are going. And then there are people who know someone who's going, who knows which is an important network going. also. Ah, okay. See, I'm Levity Zone listeners, I'm getting <laughs> PR 101 from Al Lindell, who I've known since 1994. Yeah, you know, reaching people and connecting with uh, those who uh, you want to connect with, that's the key. That's, that's the key. Uh, and here comes Peter. doesn't have to be millions. It's just be the right Professional camera to get our shot. <laughs> this is great. Thank you. <laughs> you know, we're actually recording a podcast that will go live in two weeks. Yeah. You're part of the real time crew. This is the real time movie. This is that's the real time it. movie. Yeah. And so the, the dude making it all mythic would show up next after it's created, right? It's yep. like this first story layer. It totally is. See up <laughs> The story layer. See, the, the mythic makers are the ones that we need now. As long as they're telling good mythics. Not fast food mythics, but full sit down dinner mythics. Substance <laughs> mythics. Substance yes. mythics. Sun food mythics. Sun food mythics. Yeah. You know, you guys are both avatars of the mythic journey and have held space for that as, um, you know, the first comers. Yeah, we got in the yeah. chow queue at the first stage. That's why our pear-shaped bodies are emerging. <laughs> I'm, I, think I'm, I'm, I think I'm winning that one. <laughs> <laughs> Alan's winning the race to the pear. So I'm looking, I'm looking for a new mythic type while I, you know, of course, do more things to get in shape. But meanwhile, uh, what about the happy Buddha? You know, I kind of like that myth. I'd like to know more about his story. Yeah, the happy yeah. Buddha. I'm pretty sure the happy Buddha yeah. did a lot of meditation and fasting. And stuff like that. Really? Did you get that way? Yeah. yeah. He must have. Yeah, he must have, you know. <laughs> well, in, in Peru... We came up with uh, a new brand of T-shirt yeah. called Buddha's Bad Day, yeah. and one of the T-shirts, the Buddha sitting against the, the tree with his his cell phone, saying, "Who forgot to pay the cell phone bill?" And on another Buddha's Bad Day T-shirt, he's sitting against the tree, and there's this line of people, yeah. and there's a sign saying, "Form line here," <laughs> and the Buddha's thought bubble is coming up, and he's saying, "I wish I'd never been enlightened." <laughs> So, so we're gonna print these T-shirts, and the Dalai Lama will wear them, and you know, nice. Well, because he does, he wears stuff like that. Well, you see, that's the thing. Bad day. Um, I think the way out of it, from what I can see, you break the wheel of this cycle, this program, and you instead of teaching your students what you teach them, you teach them to just uh, be the guru themselves, right? So everyone becomes guru, and it's no longer a 
hierarchy need the guru trip going on anymore ah. something like that you know uh, okay. I think that's the real gurus teach you that that you are your own guru that, but that then you tune in. what if you need followers you can't find oh, you them don't. everyone's a guru I guess the high cosmic truth is you don't need followers you create <laughs> them you create like you need them well it's now, Alan you said you need 64,000 followers right? well that was that was uh, Robert Anton Wilson's belief he was into this and for him it worked. Here's an indie author, he got some fame for writing for Playboy in the 60s, mm -hmm. and he had a following. Not a huge following, not in the millions, uh, but, you know, he he had about 64,000 <laughs> followers, followers. And, uh, that would actually buy his, like, books, buy his uh, CDs, videos, that sort of thing. And so, you know, 64,000 times $5 a year, well, you figure it out, that's over $300,000. And you can live on that. Yeah. You know, all right, 64,000. Chris Academy talks about the variety of products, all of that can be built around those concepts and so oh. that we can all like have our own brand or have our own thing. And of course, this falls into alignment with the movement forward of the individual guru and the movement towards a more collective gestalt, everyone's coming together to support oh. everyone else less like you know I have to get mine and more we can all get this together together kind of a paradigm how did the Knights of the Round Table do it were they all rich lords in and of themselves they were yeah, yeah. okay so they had an advantage they, they had a lot of producing farms behind them we've got some people in the, the tribe that have zero dollars right I mean there's the zero dollar people have, have value in other realms right and if we can transcend yeah. the paradigm where the money I mean well the money's the only well energy exchange I guess in an equitable way would be uh, yeah yeah you know, how do we how do we create a paradigm within ourselves whereby we are embodying the ideal? It feels more real to me that everyone is co-creating in what is appropriate for their avatar and that, that the money is distributed by virtue of a shared round table of ideas in which beings are recognized in their throne. Mm -hmm. and that the money is distributed and that the metaphor of the knights with their farms being a substance of value there are many different kinds of farm like there are beings who don't have a lot of money but have a lot of love and don't understand how to market that there are beings who are really good at marketing but don't have a lot of love so it'd be good to know what everyone is good at i feel that yeah. that follows and the idea of, of right purpose it's the primary gnostic axiom yeah. know myself and they will move to at the same time the proper position and what's interesting unfolding. is to observe the two of you guys I'm sorry, did I cut you off, brother? No, no, it, it's just that it, it becomes self-evident when everyone wakes up to their own, mm. their own power, their mm -hmm. own center. Mm -hmm. And yet we are in the process of waking up. So therefore, there is an application of emotional cognitive alchemy that must be applied in mm -hmm. order to negotiate the line of mystery within the self, the subconscious patterns. And like, for example, mm -hmm. I observe that you being an avatar of the future, me being an avatar of the myth, we're all avatars of, with varying quantities of mm -hmm. the same thing, right? Bruce being an avatar of, uh, it's like you're redeeming science mm. by encompassing the deva. Mm. And I represent the deva, you know, I'm deep in that. But you've, you have such authority that you've gained, from my point of view, that is appropriate to your dharma where you've gone through it. And now as you're making the transition deeper into your own mythic self, you become the perfect conduit for presenting that to people. Mm. You know, you become the doorway. And you are the witness of this grand futuristic thing. And we're meeting here in a place, if you could see the, the camera, where the light meets the water. Yeah. Is bloodline still an important way of understanding who we are? I think it is. When I was in Peru last year, they started playing Bach's cello concerti. Yeah. And I instantly was a white powder wigged guy mm. in a debate in the 17th century the Enlightenment was happening, and I saw how Europe was refashioning itself. And then I looked across the water, and I saw my ancestor, Sir John Harmon. Yeah. He was Admiral of the White Fleet and the Blue Fleet for the Crown. And he winked at me as if to say, keep the Europeans busy while we build our empire, while I dispatch my ships. And then the next moment I was traipsing down the parapets of this medieval castle, with beautiful ladies and their fans on either side. Europe knew what it was. Europe had the enlightenment and knew what it was. 
and it lost that in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution. The Enlightenment went down, Industrial it went, went up. It went down, yeah. But for about 300 years, they kind of knew what their civilization was. And when it was turned for one house to have the warrior dominance, they did. When it was a turn for another to send the daughter to be married, to connect the bloodlines, this is why we come back to bloodlines, they did that. And they really nailed it. They had pushed the Catholic Church off. Mm. You know, they'd heaved that off and created a new world. Okay. It lasted about 350 years, and then in came industrialization and merchants and mercantile wealth and power and technology. And we're at the end of that cycle now. We may be. We may be. My feeling is that the actual state of humanity is as a collective and that beings are going through a process of transformation of consciousness in which the imprints that are the genesis of that, that create the sense of self currently, are in a process of reformation. Mm. You know, in which everything, all of the systems, all the industries, distribution of resources, identification of life purpose, appreciation of one's unique gifts, all of these things are shifting, and I, I consider this to be the awakening. Like today is the renaissance. Like, is it possible to trigger off a, a truly global renaissance today? Yeah, I think it's happening. It is happening. Well, that makes yeah. it easy, then. That, that makes, makes it easy. Yeah, good. That's good. That's you're, good. you're documenting it. Uh, yes, I like to... your future. I play my own devil's advocate on this. But, yeah, yeah. But I do think there are sparks of it, and mm -hmm. the sparks um, can now be sustained. Well, on that cruise ship, I'm yeah. going to get a really good cross-section. Yes. Because I'm going on this cruise ship in a week with 400 VIPs, including the heads of Google and Uber and Martha Stewart and Harry Belafonte and, and w rich people and activists and whatnot. So that'll give us a real dialed-in sense of this yeah. right now, because a cross-section is going to be there. And there's several people that we know that are going to be on the boat, but we should try to network before, yes. before going. You should have the best schmooze tech, too. Schmooze tech? Yeah. <laughs> I'll have zero tech. If I wanted to uh, like capture the essence of a party like this, mm -hmm. naturally you'd want to be able to uh, navigate through different conversations going on in various yeah. rooms there, right? You should be there, for goodness yeah. sake. So, wow, <laughs> Peter, this is amazing. Yeah. This, this whole serendipitous connection of yeah. you, you arriving here with your camera and, and helping to guide us as we go forward. Yeah. Thank yeah, you so much, brother. Yeah, tribe I, mean, nights, man. I really appreciate that appreciation because, you know, one of the things we were talking about is that, for me, I perceive everyone's life circumstances being relative to the sculpture of their current self. Mm. So I'm suggesting that the physical form and the self and the personality is all like, like a golem, like a lens prism to which light is passing, and the un subconscious patterns inside that prism create the circumstances of our lives. And the, the more people appreciate themselves and love themselves, and the more other people appreciate them are equally mirrored, mm -hmm. and then that leads to the abundance in all forms. So what I'm noticing is that we are all in a process of coming to really appreciate each other. Like, I appreciate Al, I appreciate you. You're appreciating me in the synchronicity of the moment. You know, Alan's in my drive to be witnesses mm -hmm. for the thing, and you appreciating the synchrony of that action mm -hmm are all connected to this grand revelation that, in my point of view, leads to an appreciation of one another, which in the, like, the whole toroidal field ideal is that in the reflection, as I appreciate you, your value appreciates, like financially. A, uh, yeah, yeah, the tide rises for us all. Yeah, the tide, tide rises, rises for us all. And so, you know, Bruce and you appreciating me, our gestalt value appreciates. appreciates. Pegasus went to lightning in a bottle, which is how this whole thing on Unflowed. And you were a passenger of Pegasus. I was a passenger of Pegasus and a speaker on the Temple of Light stage, and that's what led me to be on heading. So you were at Light the Bottle this year, Bruce. I was a speaker on the big Temple of Light. Interesting. Yeah, let me ask you what you talked about on the Temple of Light. What was that? that was the story of the Eleusinian mystery. The Eleusinian mysteries. The Eleusinian mystery. Did you perchance see the kind of sculpture of the heart in red on the side of the hill by Meditation mm -hmm. Mountain. Yeah, sure. That led to the installation piece that nature created that I was oh. graciously invited to, that I helped be in service okay. for creating. Okay, okay. So one observes that at Lightning in a Bottle, where you were present and I was present, if we recognize that as being a realm of emergent consciousness, and that's why we were... That's why told, we were there. That's yeah. why we were there. And that I met Stephen Ellinger there, who told me, you know, about Samavesha, who told me about Union of the Kingdoms, which is where Dakota and I came to Union of the Kingdoms to meet Sun and Alan, ah, to then come yes, here. I'm in ruins, so. yeah, I observed right. the web 
of synchrony occurring in this moment from vantage. Mm. Like from that meditation mount, we looked down and there were these pillars going out into the reservoir with bridges between them, and each pillar had its own energy mm. and its own form. So the temple stage was with the yoga and the quietude, and then there was four mm. other peninsulas. It was beautifully staged, lightning in a bottle. I had the coveted artist camping pass. Oh, right there. Yeah, I was actually like right nice. if you went a little bit further on the mountain. Yep, there down, was a bunch of people camping. There was a back bunch of people there, including a little like really super kind of mm -hmm. uh, free folk. Uh, it was. It looked man. like the Shire. It looked like Hobbiton back that's there. Where I hey, man, I'm from the realms of fairy. You know, <laughs> that's like, that's where His I belief system like, will never be the well, same after a few of those experiences. It was yeah. so fascinating yeah. though, because like Bruce, I'm all about like explaining to beings that the nature of form from my perspective is that you're living in the literal reality of your known or unknown imprints and because my imprints are made of like the fairy you know fey deva thing i've always lived in that occurrence so the version of that world mm. in accordance with what i'm saying at lightning in a bottle was there by the natural nest there by like the zone with like those type of beings and so that's where my essence manifest mm. in that particular dimension as it occurred that's where you felt right at home and I was the bedecked peacock dancer this time in hmm. my female leggings and my Android Jones beautiful female shirt. Awesome. And wearing my oh. silks and a whole new set of <laughs> items that will be on this boat, by the way. Uh, you get, do you get some good feedback? I got some great feedback, yeah. yeah. And I'm looking forward to seeing how it affects this group on the boat. Oh, you brought some outfits? I'm going to bring the one that I used at Lightning in a Bottle because they asked for me to. Mappets? Hmm? hmm? What's a mappet? A mappet? Uh, good question. Oh, didn't you just say a mappet? Maybe a mappet is um, what happens when you go through a map and it changes oh. and it flips. Oh. So your plumage is a mappet. My plumage is a mappet. I love it. It'll cut through the crowds on that ship. Well, I'll tell you something. It sounds like a lot of people there that have used to having world stages for themselves in various mm -hmm. ways. Yeah. So the thing that they would all pay attention to is if you... Uh, could have an intelligent conversation with them on the, the evolution of that world stage that they have. Yeah. Almost none of them go to things like lightning in a bottle, so right. they don't know what youth culture is doing. Yeah, what's next? Um, magic in a si get, cyber we, bottle? What's or? next? No, we get them to come to, <laughs> to, come to our parties. There you go, real parties, real not parties, just virtual yeah. parties, right? And not just these, you know, high-end show-off-my-jewels parties, but, but real where, parties. Where real, real stuff conscious, happens. Like transformational parties. Yeah, real conscious transformational parties. Pick up a zip line down to the Johnson farm, for, for example. <laughs> I'm, I'm always down with the zip line idea. And for the 20-somethings, it's really a big hit. And for the listeners, yeah. we're way on yeah. top of a miracle mount in the Santa Cruz Mountains, looking out over Redwood Splendor and a former Christmas tree farm owned by the Johnsons. And the great thing about the zip line is that it goes through the top of the redwood arboreal forest. So you actually get to see that part of the ecosystem, the tops of the redwoods. I'd also like to mention that being here at Future Peak is the incarnation, literal physical manifestation of Alan and mm. Son's vision and alignment with the Deva, which is why they've ended up right next to the pulse of technology in the planet, yeah. right here at the top of a mystical peak with a vast, vast view, and I believe this is, or this is organic air, right? Pretty organic. This is, yeah, this it's is not, pure it's not, air. Yeah, it's, it's not pure like air. a city yeah. air. This is Old like Creek, organic yeah. It's the cleanest air, right? air in yeah. the United States. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. United we States. get to live here. Yeah, thank you. And, and it's, that's, I appreciate that. Thank you. And it, it, it's all the more true because others have chosen to be here too, like Bruce. Totally. To, and we, we went made a from, conscious decision to... We moved from ecosystem to ecosystem. That's yeah. so funny. Person. I went from ecosystem to ecosystem. <laughs> you that too, right? I went from ecosystem to ecosystem. No, no. ecosystem. I hear that. That's another story, though. <laughs> anyway. That's the story. But so here's a meme that I think it's worth spreading. Meme <laughs> worth spreading. spreading. You tell me. Yeah. <clears throat> and I know you know, think this is woo-woo science right from the start. Mm. You know, that's why I brought you into this topic. Okay. Okay. And it's the thing called chemtrails. Mm. Right? You've heard of that. Mm -hmm. And supposedly there are chemicals being left in the atmosphere. Now, is there a way in which we can just measure what's actually in the atmosphere, like with drones or something, without having to, um, you know, go to conspiracy theory on this, where we actually have some kind yeah. of real uh, insight as to what, like a NASA probe or something, well, that's a cheap kind of probe that we can do with our, ourselves, citizen science. The best example of this is James Lovelock, yeah. who in the late 60s, yeah. as an independent gentleman scientist, invented an instrument that could measure 
things in the atmosphere. He didn't have any funds, but he got free passage on a ship going to Antarctica. So he operated the instrument every day and worked out that indeed around Europe there was pollutants coming off the European continent. And it became the Montreal Protocol. So he's the one who characterized the loss of ozone and the Montreal Protocol uh, where they capped production of CFCs. And he's, in some sense, the great climate scientist. You know, he coined the term Gaia. Hmm. You know, I love and, like, yes, he's, and, he's the one that thought of the, the whole system as being one, um, one yeah. organism. One right? organism, like a, yeah. With the Gaian organism. Yeah, and my work in Origin of Life is at the very beginning of Gaia. Is where did Gaia begin? So the gel phase, the, the inspiration in Australia is yeah. the beginnings of Gaia because that's where life, even before Australia. life, got control of its environment and started right. to shape it. So the prebiotic chemistry of the gel phase and those bubbles yes. and ribozymes and pore-forming molecules and whatnot shaped the environment of the gel. All it could do is, is change the gel. Hmm. It couldn't do anything else because the Archean Earth was so violent and hmm. so nasty a place. That What's an Archean? 